Good morning. Good morning to all. Happy Easter. Uh, let me say before we start today, uh, I hope Easter uh, is a great blessing to each of you as we today celebrate uh, the death and resurrection of our Savior and living Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. I am so grateful that I have a uh, God that is living that's not dead and buried somewhere. I thank God that he allowed Jesus to rise from the grave. And that's why I celebrate and that's why I claim Jesus as my Lord. As far as announcements this week, this being Easter Sunday, uh, we are having uh, Sunday morning at 7 a.m., our sunrise service. Uh, don't know what whether it's going to be inside or out. Uh, the preacher was talking at prayer meeting Wednesday night. He might uh, just do the FM antenna or we might have it inside, but uh, the plans are to have it outside, and I hope the Lord willing, but it looks like the weather's going to be cold. 8 a.m. is our famous Aceville breakfast. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, it's always a meal uh, and a treat to get everyone together in church and enjoy our breakfasts. Uh, usually we have a little bit of everything. Uh, 9 a.m. is going to be our live Sunday school. Don't forget that time change. Uh, we're still working through this, and as everyone's learning about our 9 a.m. Sunday schools, uh, 10 a.m. is worship, and the way I understand it this week, uh, we might have a short devotion or, or no uh, uh, preaching, but just our, our cantata for Easter service. And there'll be no evening worship service uh, Sunday evening uh, to allow our families to celebrate Easter with their families. Wednesday, we return back to prayer meeting uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, now, today's lesson is one, uh, and, and I've got to share this with you. Uh, but uh, if you ask me, uh, am I the one that needs to be teaching this letter, lesson, I would tell you no. Uh, quick, uh, the title of today's lesson is Following God's Design. Uh, the subtitle is God Expects His People uh, to Show Wisdom Through Sexual Purity. As I began studying this week and found out that the topic was about sexual purity, uh, in a Christian matter, a Christian marriage, uh, sort of wanted to say no, and and maybe even, and I even mentioned to Miss Fran about changing the subject. Uh, if you've been following me with these online Sunday schools, and I think, uh, little Ernie might tell you, I think I'm right at 52 or 53, so it's been exactly a year. Uh, every Sunday for a solid year now, we've given you and offered these online Sunday school lessons. Uh, but last uh, June or July, when we were supposed to have this lesson, uh, teaching from Proverbs, uh, I did not teach it. I did change the subject. Uh, but this week as I prayed, I felt God saying to me, uh, I put that lesson in the book. I put that lesson in there for July 5th of 2020. Uh, I put COVID-19 in the air and had that lesson moved uh, for Aceville Baptist Church to April 4th of 2021. And I did it is what God has said to me. I did it for a reason. Uh, for you see, God wants someone to hear this lesson a day. So I'm going to do my best on what I know and how I've studied this week to share this lesson with you about God's design. Uh, to begin, I found this introduction in the commentary, which helps me uh, introduce this lesson to us as we study this week. Uh, and I found it be appropriate to try to help us get started. He said this, A young pastor uh, walked slowly to his car in the hospital's dimly lit parking lot. lot. He and his wife had arrived at the medical center long before dawn that day. She was about to give birth to their fourth child and had gone into labor in the middle of the previous night. Complications arose during labor, however, and the birth process dragged on in the late afternoon of the next day. Finally, on the doctor, doctor's recommendation, the new baby was delivered by cesarean, or as we call it, C-section. Everyone was okay. Exhausted, yes, but okay. Mother and child would need to remain in the hospital uh, for a day or two longer to recuperate from the procedure. So the pastor decided to go home for the evening and check on their other children. As the pastor approached his car, he noticed a young lady standing in the shadows nearby. 
When she stepped into the light, he recognized her as someone he knew quite well from the church community. In fact, the woman had visited with the pastor and his wife earlier that afternoon as they awaited for the birth of their child to come. She complained that her car had broken down and wondered at this time if he might be able to give her a ride home. Now, I want to stop right there. I want to stop and I want to think, get each of you to think about in today's world, should this young pastor with his wife and, and, and new baby in the hospital in the middle of the night give this young lady a ride home? And again, in the live Sunday school class on Sunday, I think we're going to discuss this, but what should this pastor do? Why should he or why not should he give this lady a ride home? If you take the yes standpoint, yes, take the lady home. But here's the situation. He would risk other people seeing him with another lady in the middle of the night by himself. This young pastor and a lady by themselves. What would that look like? If you said no to our discussion, he understood the risk of being rude and hateful as a young pastor. So what should this young pastor do? The young pastor was faced with a dilemma. How could he say no to a past person's request for help when it is within his ability to help this person? What kind of ministry example would that set? Would she spread word in the church community that the pastor was called? Or was he callous and unconcerned about her needs? And maybe about the needs of other people when they came to him. On the other hand, what gossip might arise in the community? If people saw the pastor along with the young woman in his car pulling up to her house late in the evening. As these thoughts began to compete in his mind, racing through the young pastor's mind, the Lord suddenly solved the dilemma for him. One of the church's deacons and his wife, who had also been visiting in the hospital, approached them. They graciously offered to give the young woman a ride home. Today, as in Solomon's time, no one is immune from the pervasive presence of sexual temptations. Not even pastors or church members or Sunday school teachers. It isn't an easy topic to discuss in church Bible studies either. Yet the Bible addresses the need for sexual purity in the, both the Old and the New Testaments. One of those places in the Old Testament is in Proverbs chapter 5. Because God created us as sexual beings, he also provided his wisdom to guide us in the proper expression of our sexuality. He explains, expects believers to show his wisdom through their decisions regarding sex and sexual purity. Look with me now as we try, start to understand. Get your Bibles out now. Turn with me to chop Proverbs chapter 5. Now those, that, again, if was back with me in June and July last year, we didn't have this lesson. So this is a brand new lesson. Proverbs chapter 5 talks about marriage in the technical sense as an agreement that formalizes the relationship needed to comprise a family. Thus, it includes the basic understanding of acceptable and unacceptable behaviors of the husband and wife toward each other, as well as the couple's interactions with others outside the marriage bond. Biblical teaching affirms that the Lord God designed a marriage relationship back in Genesis, which he, when he established man and woman. Thus, we should not be surprised to find numerous places in Scripture where God's original design for the marriage relationship comes for the forefront. The Scripture today, as I mentioned, is in Proverbs chapter 5. This Scripture focuses on using God's wisdom regarding sexual behavior. Once again, Solomon in Proverbs chapter 5 is teaching a lesson to his son by teaching his son to avoid temptations and go down the right path. He is giving his information, his wisdom, down to his son. Now, as we studied, and we did this last week, what is the right path? What are the paths to take? Last week, we heard a lesson on two paths. 
the path of sin, and the path of righteousness. And of course, we remember from last week, the path of righteousness leads to blessings you receive by making godly decisions. Today, we see two paths again that Solomon is teaching his son about. The path of temptation and the path of sexual purity. The path of temptation leads to sexual immorality leads to miserable outcomes that would make that person regret their choice. Very similar to the path of sin last week. But the path of sexual purity and in marriage, the path devoted to his wife, and in the Bible says will lead to a life of fulfillment of sexual intimacy as God intended it to be. What a beautiful thing that God has done for his people. Now look with me now at Proverbs chapter 5, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, which we're going to call the path of temptation. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable. That thou canst not know them. Wow. Very simple scripture. But let's think about it for a few moments. Let's understand what Solomon is saying to his son. Solomon starts out in this lesson to his son by urging his son to use his lips to pass along godly instruction, just as he's doing. Pass along this godly instruction to his sons, to his daughters, for all future generations to know this same wisdom. And he gives his son a warning. He says, stay away from a strange woman's lips. A strange woman's lips would lure him into things he should not do. In Bible times, the honeycomb was probably the sweetest thing you could get. The honey from this honeycomb could be used to sweeten things, and, and I'm, I, I'm assuming that sugar had not been developed yet, so honeycomb was the most natural thing that you can put in and use for cooking and baking to make things sweet. But then there was the olive oil. Olive oil also was used for cooking, baking, making bread. It was always pure and flowed very easy. Paying attention to a seductive woman could prove to be dangerous. In the end, a single sexual encounter with a forbidden woman would lead to horrible consequences. For you see, God's plan for marriage involves one man and one woman who devote themselves to each other for a lifetime. The path a married couple takes together proves to be rewarding because they come to understand that sex with each other renders true and lasting fulfillment. It's one of life's enriching blessings that comes by living according to God's wisdom. On the other hand, the Proverbs here points out that sexual immorality and being with a strange woman can lead you to face the wormwood. I had to look it up. A wormwood is a shrub that has a bitter flavor. Or maybe having sexual immorality, it maybe is like a two-edged sword, sharp on both edges. It will cut. A person who goes down the path of immorality will be left with nothing but extreme bitterness and possibly awful misery. Think about it. Do you want to go down that path? But let's think about it long term. Long term. Proverbs 5, verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Hear me now, therefore, O you children, and depart not from the words of thy mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, 
and thy labor being the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Think about sexual immorality down the long term, down the long path. Now that Solomon issued a, ma a warning to his son, he now turns to, and the scripture says, O ye children. This refers to the young, other young males in the royal court. This includes all young males today and all young males in generations to come. Solomon says, the best way to keep from giving in to temptations would be to avoid even the slightest possibility of coming into contact with sexual immorality at all. Just last week we learned, don't even take the first step down the path of sin. It will lure you down the path of sin to the point where you can't get off the path. Solomon urges his son and young, all young men to keep their distance from seductive and forbidden women. Her tempting ways will put a, pull a man away from his commitment to the Lord and from his wife. Tempting him with the possibility of sex and sexual gratification would cause him to let go of his devotion to his wife. For that reason, Solomon in this proverb says, stay away from her door. Avoid the first step on the path to sexual immorality. Verses 9, 10, and 11 that we just read says and answers this question. Why not give in? It won't hurt anyone but me, right? Wrong. No. Solomon says giving in to sexual immorality with a woman outside of marriage places a person in danger of losing respect, honor, and dignity. Who are others that might rob us of our respect, honor, and dignity? Think about it. This young lady that wants to have sexual immorality with this man who has a wife at home there's other people around her. Possibly there's the other lovers of the forbidden woman. There's the owners of the forbidden woman. There's the husband of an unfaithful wife. Strangers of the relatives of the unforbidden woman. For you see, there are things like diseases, age, and even other people that can cause decay to both the forbidden woman and the unfaithful man. It can lead to death and honor and dignity and death of respect. The teacher's book asks, when do people caught up in sexual sin usually get caught? See that they've been foolish. When do they see that? When do they finally recognize that they've been foolish? Look with me now at the last section, which is entitled, Enjoy God's Provisions, Proverbs 5, 15, 16, 17, and 18. I love this. This is this is beautiful pictures that Solomon paints here. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. And finally, in verse eighteen, let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife. Wife of thy youth. Solomon in these verses uses word pictures to promote the blessings God offers from having a pure marriage. The first thing he uses is pure water. In Solomon's day, pure water was a precious treasure for drinking, bathing, cooking. For you see, the desert climate did not offer much water. Water was life. Without it, nothing survived. By the same thought, the health, survival, and benefits of a healthy marriage depends on being faithful to each other. That's what Solomon meant when he mentioned cistern. Wise people in Bible times collected rainwater in a cistern to make it available for use for a long time. A cistern, Solomon says, is like a faithful wife. A man with a faithful wife has pure water for a long time. A man with a faithful wife 
has a pure companion for a long time. Verse 16 and 17 gives a word of caution. Never let strangers enter into your marriage, for you see adultery is a sin, and God prohibited us from allowing it in our marriage. Exodus 20, 14 makes it simple. You shall not commit adultery. There's a harsh reality about adultery. God intended the union between a husband and wife to be marked with fidelity. In that marriage, intimacy would grow as a couple stayed devoted solely to each other. These blessings will disappear when adultery comes into play. No longer will the couple enjoy the unique blessings that they alone enjoy from the result of being fruitful. Now in verse 18, he uses another word picture. This is the second one. Solomon closes with another word picture. This time he uses a fountain. In a fountain, water flowed freely, and the source that led, fed the fountain was pure and provides a never-ending supply of water. In the same way, sexual intimacy in marriage renders a blessing for a husband and wife that will be a source of endless joy as they share their life together. Blessings. Blessings that come from a faithful life. Today, my conclusion is going to be a little bit negative, but I hope this will be a lesson for you, and it's going to be a little bit long, but I found this, and I did want to share it. I don't know, and a lot of us, especially at our age and our class, remember the column in the newspaper when we used to read it, Ask Ann Landers. Ask Ann Landers your question. Syndicated advice columnist Ann Landers, in a sad and personal message to her readers, announced Monday night in 1975 she will be divorced from her husband, Jews Letterer, after 36 years of marriage. The Chicago Sun-Times columnist, whose real name is Epi Letterer, said in early Tuesday, Addition, she felt she owed it to her readers to make the announcement in her column. She said her marriage was one of the world's best and refused to elaborate on the reasons for ending it in divorce. In my 20 years as being Ann Landers in the paper, this is the most difficult column I have ever tried to put together and write, said Ann Landers. I do so after many hours of soul searching. Should it be written at all, would it be appropriate? Would it be fair? I have decided yes, because you, my Reavers, are also my friends. I owe it to you to say something. There should be some word directly from me. The sad, incredible fact is that, is that after 36 of years of marriage, Jews and I are being divorced. As I write these words, it is as if I'm returning to a letter referring to a letter from a reader. It seems unreal that I am writing about my own marriage. She said every word in two previous columns she had written about the intimacy of her marriage was true, and that very little that was said that could be said today in complete honesty. I found a follow-up to this letter that she wrote in the paper, and it goes on to give you an explanation which I want to share with you today about a pure marriage. Some time ago, Ann Landers, the answer lady, wrote a column in Tanner entitled, Answer Lady Has No Answers. Acknowledged that after 36 of years of marriage, her husband and her were divorcing. In her column, she wrote how she expressed her astonishment that it could happen. Once she had a very good relationship. Ann Landers' perplexing question to the newspaper how did it happen that something was so good turned out so bad? When they married, they enjoyed each other, liked each other, were friends, lovers, confidants, were excited about seeing each other. But over the years, their relationship began to deteriorate. Affection turned to dislike. Excitement turned to boredom. Attraction turned to other interests. Enjoyment turned to other things. So she asked, how 
does it happen? Safe to say, most couples who marry do so because they really enjoy each other. They are excited about each other. But they don't get married because they hate each other. But all too often, this has changed for many couples. Ann Zlander's situation is not an isolated instance. But I don't believe this has to happen. I do believe it's possible for married people to remain sweethearts throughout their entire lives if they make and fulfill certain commitments. That's what marriage is in God's eyes, a commitment. Marriage wasn't man's invention, something just for caveman, something socially convenient for a time, but now outdated. No, God created it to be a covenant. Yes, this means a contract. It is a commitment, a covenant, made with God and each other for life. This covenant is not based upon feelings, but on the will. We live in such a feeling-oriented society. On the feeling of self is at the center. On the feeling people act based upon how they feel at the moment. No. For you see, a couple can remain sweethearts throughout their entire lives if they will commit themselves to following God's blueprint, blueprint for marriage. A Christian marriage is based upon making and fulfilling certain requirements and commitments. These commitments are found in Scripture, as we've studied today from Proverbs. They are sort of a blueprint for marriage, a blueprint for building a foundation, which will last as long as God gives you life on this earth. When a couple lives by God's instructions, God's wisdoms, and these commitments, they will never cease to enjoy their marriage relationship. They will never seem simply to coexist. They will remain sweethearts. As we conclude today, I want to ask the married couples, are you and your wife still sweethearts? If we were in discussion, I'd love to tell my wife right now, and this is for everyone, yes, I'm still a sweetheart with my wife. I still love her more than ever, especially since I retired, and can stay home to see her every day, which I used to miss when I traveled so much. I pray that this lesson today has been that blessing that God said that someone needed, and I pray today that each of you get a blessing from it. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this scripture. We thank you for your word. We thank you for God's holy word, the Bible. We thank you that you sent Jesus, that he came to an old rugged cross. He gave his life, but yet, God, you gave him his life again, that he could be the sacrifice for our sins, that we could have life and come to see you once again. We're going to see you, Lord. We're waiting on your returning, and we're going to come to heaven to be with you, Jesus. We pray that today is a blessing and a great holiday for all the people listening. For each person out there is watching today, we thank you. and We pray God will bless you. Help you to have a good week. First in Christ's name we pray. Amen.